Hello everyone, welcome to From the Star Wars Library, where Star Wars is in print, the Force is with the readers, and I guess I should be saying dark greetings, ladies and gentlemen, for this episode. I'm your host, Nathan P. Butler. We're still amid 1992's Star Wars releases here, and while the last episode featured Dark Force Rising, it was not the only new Star Wars book released in 1992. For many, though, that's the only one they want to acknowledge. There was another publishing line of Star Wars books out there, though, and this episode brings us to them. Sometimes called the Jedi Prince series, sometimes called the Trioculus Saga, these are books that were published by Bantam, but not by Bantam Spectra, but by Bantam Skylark. They're young reader books, essentially, uh, geared towards readers about the same age as those reading Galaxy of Fear, which is even younger than, say, Jedi Quest, Jedi Apprentice, and so forth in recent times. The first of these books, it's a series of six, written by Paul and Hollis Davids, the first of this series of books is known as The Glove of Darth Vader, which is also sometimes used as a name for the entire series. This is the original version, published in July 1992. There are some newer versions with different, slightly cooler looking uh, logos, has Star Wars a little bit higher, has The Glove of Darth Vader down here in a different font and whatnot. This is what a first printing copy of that book looks like. And uh, they really are kind of an odd series here. We'll get to the continuity ramifications in a moment, but just in general, cool Drew Struzan covers and such. We've got, for one, as you open it up, you start out with essentially a dramatist persona, but instead of character descriptions, it's character pictures. I've always thought that was a really cool way to set up these books and something that a lot of other books could possibly have benefited from in doing so. I think the only thing that comes close to how comprehensive some of the stuff is in here is the Essential Readers Companion, which has those great images at the beginning of each section with some of the main characters from a particular time period. You move past that to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, taking up an entire page to do that amidst a star feel, which is kind of cool, albeit odd. And then, sort of like an opening crawl, it's The Adventure Continues. And The Adventure Continues is essentially a quick description of what's going on. With the Empire's evil leaders gone and their battle station destroyed, a new era has begun. Imperial warlords have been fighting for power among themselves, but no one knows who will seize control. However, the prophets of the dark side have foretold that a new emperor will soon arise, and on his hand, he shall wear an indestructible symbol of evil, the glove of Darth Vader. It's interesting. So, for kids who presumably are reading these books, because they've seen the Star Wars films, they take the time to recap the trilogy except recap it in kind of an odd, disjointed sort of way, with at least that last paragraph, which is, you know, to be fair, separated out from the rest of it here, down there at the bottom, um, using that as essentially the opening crawl to send us in media res into the story itself. Um, the whole issue of the Prophets of the Dark Side making that prophecy is used as backstory for this, presumably taking place between... Return of the Jedi, and this, which at the time, uh, there was nothing set between except for the Marvel stuff, and remember, at this point, the Marvel stuff didn't count. So what we have here is the beginning of a saga that is said to take place, at least now we place it, one year after the events of Return of the Jedi. There was some question at the time, but it's one year after Return of the Jedi. And because of the way the events play out in this book, and the five that follow, originally meant to be the eight that follow, supposedly, um, we wind up with one of the first big continuity issues to arise with this new expanded universe. We'll talk about that more specifically when we get to the final book in this series. However, we can say up front that originally the way that canon worked in Star Wars, or the way that uh, the expanded universe's canon and such, the official continuity worked in Star Wars, was not like the Holocron continuity database, where each element of a story is given a designation, uh, which these days barring what happens now with the story group and with Disney and all that, uh, these days is essentially G, T, C, S, and N levels of canon. Um, not necessarily to give us a distinction of how we should read things, although it winds up being that way, um, so much as just a way for them to know inside Lucasfilm what should be used in what story, what information has been given about something, what counts, what doesn't, to keep things consistent. But before that, basically what canon meant was that at Lucasfilm there was this list or a pair of lists. There's a list of what counts and a list of what doesn't. And entire books and entire comics wound up on either of those lists, not elements from them. So what happens to this series, thanks to what happens in the sixth book, will wind up kicking all six books out of the continuity for quite a while. 
only for them to later be referenced in other works, such as the Essential Chronology and such, that sort of bring things back in. But for a while there, since there was no Holocron continuity database, the example that we were given, or the, uh, the explanation we were given, was not so much that the books were back at all, but that maybe these are an alternate universe somewhere. But just because an alternate universe might follow this, and there might be characters from this in the official Star Wars continuity, doesn't mean the official Star Wars continuity has the whole book. It just means there's an alternate universe version that might be similar, but not identical to this one. Um, kind of confusing, but something that, you know, kind of sci-fi fans have come to expect from years and years of alternate reality and time travel stories. But nowadays, this series is brought back into the continuity, albeit with some tweaks and retcons to make everything work a little bit better. As such, given the way that these have been sort of shoehorned in with everything else, let me give you a lead-in that I actually wrote for my Star Wars Timeline goal, which again you can find at StarWarsFanWars.com slash timeline, so you get a sense of where this is actually coming in from and how it fits with some broader continuity around it, of bringing in information from various EU sources. The New Republic moves its base, or one of its bases, to Yavin 4 where the Provisional Council, calling itself the Senate for some purposes, creates a small selective group within the New Republic, much like the insiders during the Yuzhan Vong invasion years later, called SPIN, the Senate Planetary Intelligence Network, where planetary doesn't make a lot of sense because it actually covers multiple systems. Among the members of this group are Luke Skywalker and the other heroes of the Galactic Civil War. The Alliance also renames Mount Dagger on Dagobah as Mount Yoda and sets up the Defense Research and Planetary Assistance Center, or DRAPAC, D-R-A-P-A-C, on it, also setting up Dagobah Tech, which is a school for the children of researchers who were assigned to DRAPAC. Meanwhile, the Empire is realigning as well. The Central Committee of Grand Moffs has had great power in the Empire, but it's now on its heels. Yasan Iceheart Isard's power base is growing too strong, and they need to move against her soon. Along with that problem, the prophets of the dark side have gone into seclusion, but a set of imposters, fake prophets of the dark side led by a fake high prophet Kadan, has pronounced that the heir to the emperor's throne will wear the right hand glove of Darth Vader, a Mandalorian crush gaunt that Vader had fitted around one of Lord Kan's indestructible Sith amulets. Seizing upon the fact that they know that Palpatine has a mutant three-eyed son, Triclops, a former Emperor's Eye, who is said to be insane, the committee decides to set up the Supreme Slave Lord of Kessel, man named Trioculus, who is also a three-eyed mutant, as the answer to the rumors of Palpatine having an heir. As rumblings of their power moves spread throughout intelligence networks, the New Republic, still referred to by some as the Rebel Alliance, must make its move to learn the truth behind the rumors and stop the ascension of a new emperor at all costs. Thus, our story progresses. And as a story told, again, kind of the big type there, it's for younger readers. It's got some cool chapter titles and such. It also has artwork inside, which is kind of neat, not something we see a lot uh, with many of the young reader books, except the ones that teach you how to read and such. And something I think is kind of cool, aside from having a preview in the back of the next book in the series, there's also a glossary, sort of like a guide to the Star Wars universe, except done uh, in miniature at this point. And yeah, mine's whew, not in all that great a shape at this point. The, the stickiness of the spine is starting to come undone here because it is kind of old. Essentially, the story of this book is that there are rumors out there about uh, this big meeting coming up amongst the Committee of Grand Moffs, a big Imperial meeting on Kessel. So C-3PO and R2-D2, C-3PO and R2-D2 being altered somewhat in their appearance, because, hey, their droids are sent to Kessel to spy on this meeting. And they wind up then hooking up with Luke, bringing information from the meeting. In the meeting, uh, Grand Moff Hissa, one of the Committee of Grand Moffs, proclaims basically that Trioculus, this three-eyed slave lord of Kessel, is the heir to the Empire. Not to be confused with the book of the same name. That he's the heir to Palpatine because he's this three-eyed mutant, and there's those rumors that Palpatine had a son like that, which we don't meet in this book just yet. Um, he even uses force lightning to zap those who stand against him because he doesn't have the glove of Darth Vader the way that the prophet said he would. Of course, we'll find out later the force lightning is actually implants to create the lightning and it's slowly going to kill him if he keeps using it. Um, he's a fake. 
essentially here. We know he's a fake. They don't know that he's a fake at this point. The mission then heads to Mon Calamari, or Dak, or Calamari, as they say in here, or Mon Cala, as Lucas apparently recently decided to call it, um, the home world of the Mon Calamari and the Quarren, where uh, Captain Dunwell of the Whaledon hunting fleet, uh, Whaledons are like these sentient um, whale things that sing, that are uh, kind of attuned to the force, that sort of thing, uh, led by one named Leviathor. Uh, anyway, turns out, that, as we find out, as it's finally explained later on, when the Death Star went kablooey, Vader's hand, right? Remember the gah, 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 ah! moment where Vader loses his hand and causes Luke to look at the fact that he's got his artificial hand and so forth, and he sees that parallel between himself and his father. Um, that hand, when it was cut off, was still left on the Death Star. Luke apparently didn't go find it anywhere because... It fell, presumably, down a shaft. Um, he didn't wind up taking it back when he burned Vader's body, so that hand is still out there. And when the Death Star exploded, thanks to the later retcon of the uh, Mandalorian Crush Gaunt and uh, Sith Amulet thing, it was essentially indestructible, so it wasn't destroyed in the explosion. Instead, it was slung out into space and eventually wound up going to what we now know of as the Indoor Gate Wormhole. It's this uh, rip in the fabric of space and time. It's like a black hole kind of thing um, that's relatively near to Indoor. It's uh, in the Model sector. As it goes through that, it gets spit out over Mon Calorian, winds up going boom down into the ocean. And now it has been found on that planet. Um, the Indoor Gate Wormhole, by the way, is also what they now say was the weird rip in space and time back in that Lost in Time Droids and Ewoks crossover from the Star Comics that we covered a while back on this video series. Suffice to say, uh, Dunwell calls in, Trioculus calls in the Empire so that Trioculus can get his hand on the glove and now proclaim himself to be the true heir to the Empire. He now is not only a three-eyed mutant, supposedly the son of Palpatine, but he has the glove just as the Prophets of the Dark Side said. And in this series, we're not given any indication the Prophets of the Dark Side are fake. That's because they later create a new backstory for them and tweak it a few times, so there's some inconsistencies, and they say, well, see, these are fakes. The real ones were in seclusion, so they can be used in other stories in different ways. Um, we'll eventually find out that one of the Prophets of the Dark Side is even Black Hole, Lord Cronel, from back in Classic Star Wars The Early Adventures, the Russ Manning newspaper strips, um, that eventually winds up playing a big role in Luke Skywalker and the Shadows of Mendor. Lots of fertile ground here for stuff that gets tweaked later on in the continuity, uh, in some cases even before these books are really acknowledged uh, more than they are usually. Our heroes, Luke and the droids and such, wind up arriving. Uh, they work with Akbar, save some Whaladons, and in the process, they learn of the existence of Trioculus and the Glove, and it's kind of an oh-crap moment. The Empire has a new leader. We need to find out some way to stop him, uh, as it leads out setting up the next book in the series, released actually the exact same month. The first two were released in July of 1992, and it's that second book that'll be the subject of our next episode. So, it's an odd one. Um, I love the way they formatted this thing. I love the whole pictures for the dramatist persona. I love the idea of having the glossary in the back. Uh, I even kind of like the fact that they summarize the films because this is the first, what was thought to be, in continuity kids book at the time. Um, so it kind of makes sense in that case. I like the fact that it's illustrated throughout. I just wish that these had been more coordinated with the other books so there wasn't so much controversy surrounding them back at the time. So, we'll do our normal question here. Is this book... The Glove of Darth Vader, an essential read. I'd say it's an essential read if you're going to read all six books in this series, because obviously it's the first, it's the foundation. You'll need all six to make sense of all six. As for the broader Star Wars continuity, uh, if you're dealing with the expanded universe the way we think of it now, the official continuity, not taking into account who knows what Disney's going to wind up doing with it at that point, um, not really. I would say it's not an essential read. Because it's been tweaked so much, you'd probably do better to read a summary of this on the Star Wars Timeline Gold or in one of the essential chronologies or something rather than necessarily checking out these books themselves. Uh, unless you want to see some weirdness from early continuity so you can see how this is going to wind up clashing with other things and wind up having to be reworked to work it back in. Certainly an unusual part of a Star Wars publishing history here, and something I'm glad that I have, and glad that I've had a chance to read and reread, is just one of those things that isn't essential if we're looking at things in a big picture sort of way. With that, we'll wrap up this episode. Thank you for watching, and may the Force be with the readers.